Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. Today on the show, we have one of our listeners, Teresa, who wrote in to me a couple months ago with this incredible story. And it immediately jumped off the page to me as something that is just an absolute inspiration for everyone who has made some choices that they aren't exactly happy with. And frankly, that's all of us, right? We've all made significant choices in the past that, that we have to overcome. And some of us more so than others. And I think Teresa's story starts back in her teenage years where she opened that first credit card. And then a few short years later, it was 15 credit cards. And then it turned into debt. And there were ultimately a series of decisions that led her to a place where she needed to pick herself up and pick herself up she did. And it's truly remarkable where she has come from and where she is today. And I just cannot wait for you to hear this story. So with that, welcome to Choose FI. <music> Teresa, I am so happy you're here. Thank you for reaching out to me and thank you for being part of the community. I'm so, so excited to be here with you. You can't even imagine. I'm like fangirling right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is great. I mean, well, first, I, I actually want to start somewhere a, a little bit different. You reached out to me and I, I just played it up that I read your story and I got back to you instantly, which is not exactly what happened, right? So I did read your story and was blown away and was meaning to get back to you. But unfortunately, I get hundreds of these emails and you followed up with me and I think what you did was just really cool. And I'd love for you to actually tell that one minute story. So I had heard the episode where you were talking about your daughter and how you and her composed a letter to the Cedar Fair. I think it was the CEO. And you guys gave it a catchy subject line because she's a busy woman. And I assumed you're a busy guy. And that story inspired me to resend my email with a catchy title from food stamps to Fi. Yeah. So um, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked because I wrote you back almost right away, I think, <laughs> that, that morning. And yeah, there's something about that. Like A, somebody following up and caring enough to follow up and having really the courage and audacity to do that. Like, I don't mean audacity in the, in the normal sense. It's just, it's a wonderful thing. So that was super cool. And there is something catchy about from food stamps to Fi. So yeah. And that is really all kind of part and parcel of your story, which I think is, like I said in the intro, it's just really inspiring because you have overcome a lot of things that I guess many people would consider adversity. And I don't know if, if you conceptualize it like that, and it, it's almost beside the point, but I think many people would, would term it that. So let's start from the very beginning. I guess where in your mind's eye does your financial story start? I think it started as a kid watching my parents in their financial health or lack thereof. I grew up in a divorced home, but my mom remarried when I was eight and they had twin girls when I was eight years old, like soon after they got married. So they both worked full time for the government downtown. I live in Metro Detroit and they both made good money, but they didn't spend it well. They always had credit card debt. At one point, they had two mortgages. And I know they had a lot of expenses with three kids, especially with daycare costs, having two twin girls in daycare at once. And then me, you know, being a teenager, we were like lower middle class just because we could never seem to get ahead financially. So my parents didn't model good financial health. So when I started college, you know, you go to the college fair and you get those credit card applications. So that's what I did. And my first credit card was a Citibank and it had my picture on it. And I thought it was the coolest thing. Well, back then that was like in the late nineties, we had to go to the mall when you wanted to buy stuff. Right. <laughs> so every time I walked into a store, they're like, Hey, do you want to save 20% today and then get coupons in the mail? Because we didn't have email really back then. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I want 20% off. Sign me up. So about every time I walked into a store, I would open a store credit card. So over the next few years, I had up to like 15 credit cards. And I just swiped all the time. And I was carrying debt because we were never taught to pay off your credit cards every month. That's just not something that we did in our home. So I was just carrying that along. And, you know, money was something we never really talked about either as a family. And I think society as a whole kind of thinks finance is a taboo subject for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why. I know that's not 
the case in the FI community. We love talking about money, which is awesome. I think it needs to be normalized, right? Yes. So, you know, I got engaged when I was 19 years old. And shortly after, I became pregnant with my first daughter, Ashley. I had her when I was 20. And I ended up, when she was about nine months, canceling the engagement because the dad was, you know, we were not a good fit. So I just decided to parent alone. And I was on WIC, which is Women, Infants, and Children. It's a program through the county that gives you like back then paper coupons. So I could go to the grocery store and I could get tuna fish or milk or bread or beans. You know, they weren't food stamps. You had to buy like specific foods that were listed on these coupons. Okay. And it was pretty um, humiliating to me. It was very humbling and humiliating because it's embarrassing going to the grocery store. Everyone knew what they were, right? right? So it's like, oh, this girl can't afford things. So here is a coupon from the government aid. And just for me, I didn't take pride in that. But I did it because I needed it. And it helped me tremendously. So I started working as a contract employee at one of the big three here in the Motor City. And I was a secretary. And I did that for a while. And then I had changed jobs. I still work for the same company, but I had some different roles. And all along, I'm just charging and charging on my credit cards. So by the time I was, I don't know, 22, 23, I had about $20,000 in unsecured debt. Now, a little bit of that was student loan debt as well. I went to a very small school, a private school, that my dad actually had to pay the tuition. That was part of the divorce decree. Okay. So I was very grateful for that. We were very small. There were 16 people in my graduating class. In college? <laughs> no, in high school. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. I just went backwards a minute. <laughs> wow. Okay. I was going to say that is literally the smallest college I've ever heard of. So still, that's a pretty, pretty darn small high school. It is. It was very small. It was K through 12 and there were 200 kids in the whole school. Wow. So my counselor had actually gotten me a scholarship to the local college. It was Detroit College of Business. And they had a campus literally like three miles from my house. So she had gotten me a, a scholarship that paid for half of my tuition for four years, which was really awesome. Yeah, that's amazing. So I stayed at home. I lived at home. And then I worked full time and I went to school full time. I had to attend full time in order to retain that scholarship. And I had to also stay in school to stay on my mom's health insurance which I really needed because I had a baby. I was a single mom. All right, back to my early 20s, about to graduate college. I've got about $20,000 in debt. And my cousin Andrew tells me about this debt snowball. He said it was from Dave Ramsey. And he's got this debt snowball where you take your lowest debt, the smallest amount of debt, and you pay that off while paying the minimums on all your, your other debts. And when you pay the first one off, you take that amount of money and you snowball it into the next one until the next one's paid off. And so mathematically, that doesn't always work because you're not considering interest rates or anything like that. But it's more of a psychological move where you're getting inspired and you're getting motivated to pay off your debt as you go, right? Because you're getting these little wins along the way. Right. And it frees up when you pay off that first one. It then frees up that money to then go towards the next one. Exactly. And theoretically, it makes each subsequent payoff easier because you have more money to throw at it. That's right. It's like that snowball rolling down the hill and it just gets bigger as it gathers more right. momentum, right? Okay. That was really such an interesting and incredible story. There's so many things I could ask. I, I, I don't even know where to start here. But since we're talking about credit cards, let's let's go there. So you said you had approximately 15 credit cards, but about 20,000 of debt. So it doesn't sound, depending obviously on what your credit limit, it doesn't sound like you're maxing all of these out, but yet you're utilizing many of them at that point. I guess my ultimate question is, okay, so your cousin told you about this debt snowball, let's say the month before that, like, was this a pressing issue? Because I mean, honestly, Teresa, you had a lot going on, right? You are a single mom of a one or two year old at that point, yep. you're going to school, you're working full time. I mean, there is a lot going on. And obviously, you're spending a little more than your means. So it doesn't sound like it, in fairness to you, certainly, because I know it's easy to beat yourself up, right? Yeah. But it doesn't sound like you were spending dramatically more because this was 20,000 over a number of years each month. But 
I guess at that point, what were you doing with your credit cards? Did you realize that this was a calamitous issue and you were trying to pay them off? Were you paying the minimums? Talk us through that. So I was paying the minimums on my credit cards. And I think what was my aha moment or my turning point is as I was graduating college, I really wanted to move out, but I didn't have a money and I knew I had to put some kind of financial plan together. And so I think that's what inspired me to start paying my credit cards off. Gotcha. And I actually went to a lawyer because I was like, I need to claim for bankruptcy because this is just so overwhelming to me. I, there's no way I can pay all this off on the salary that I'm making. So I went to see some guy I just that was nearby and he said, hey, listen, you're so young and this is such a small amount of debt. He's like, don't file bankruptcy. That's going to hurt your credit. That's going to create problems for you long term. Just buckle down and pay them off and you'll thank me later. And I totally did. I was so <laughs> happy that he pointed me in that direction. And I thought about going to those credit card agencies that consolidate your debt for you. And it just seemed so schemy to me when I called. Right. Like pay us a couple thousand dollar fee to consolidate. And yeah, yeah. I was like, I could just use my brain. I can do this myself. So, you know, with my cousin giving me that tool, the debt snowball, I made a spreadsheet and I just did it myself. It just took discipline, right? I had to stop spending because I was spending on necessary things because I was a single parent, but I was also spending on things I just wanted because I wanted them. Yeah. And that's certainly, I mean, that's how the world works, right? Sometimes you uh, <laughs> yeah. you have expenses that you need to pay for, especially as as a single mom. And and I just wanted to, I, I just made kind of a joke about uh, some of these consolidating companies charging you exorbitant fees. That is not to say that all of them do. There are good actors in that industry. So I was not uh, painting a broad brush that they're all terrible because they think that is a viable strategy for some people. But like you said, you got a bad feeling and, yeah, and that probably was something that was worth avoiding. So just before we move on, what made you reach out to that lawyer? Because that is like a very kind of like advanced thing for some. You, you said you're like 21 years old at this point. Like, how did you even know that bankruptcy protection was an option? Like, what, where did that come from? Probably a commercial on TV, as I'm guessing, because yeah. again, we didn't really have the internet back then. So. <laughs> We're the same age. We, we realized after. So, yeah, it's <laughs> back in the Stone Ages in the, in the late 90s, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. And it's funny because I do remember, I, I hope this doesn't occur anymore, but walking into my university's commons and there were these tables where essentially you signed up for a credit card and got a free t-shirt. It was like exactly. a like an $8 t-shirt and, and that was enough to get you to sign up. That's exactly how it all started for um, me. And yeah, like you said, <laughs> you go to a store that you frequent and hey, you get 20% off this first time if you just open our credit card. It's, it's amazing how insidious those can be, really. Uh, I know. So I took the lawyer's advice and I just made my own financial plan on a spreadsheet using the debt snowball. I started paying off my credit cards. I started saving up some money. Uh, my cousin Kelly and I moved out when I was 23. Ashley was three at the time. So we got an apartment. So it was really great sharing rent. We split food costs. We split every bill in half, essentially, which not many people would do that for someone with a kid. You know what I mean? So she was... She was an angel to me and my girls, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. And that's so this is yet another cousin who plays prominently. Yeah. I've got a lot of family. They've all been super helpful and supportive along my path. Yeah, that's so cool. So I mean, to have them in your corner is that's incredible. So so right, the big item that that helped you get moving, right, was kind of that awakening in not like the negative kind of exogenous shock that a lot of people experience, but it sounds like I want to move out at this point. So, right, you were going to this college that was three miles from home, so you were still living at home, and obviously, like you said, accumulating this credit card debt, then your first cousin says, hey, there's this debt snowball, you start rocking and rolling on that, and then your other cousin, Kelly, I believe you said, you move out when you were 23. Yeah. So, at that point, where were you on the, on the debt snowball pay down? I'd say I was about halfway done paying off my debt at that point. Gotcha. So, when I was 25... I was in a relationship for a short period of time and had another little bundle of joy come along, my daughter, Megan, which she was a really big surprise. And I actually had considered adoption at that point because I was only 25 and I had been a single mom for five years. And I felt like 
how am I going to do this with another baby? Right. And I went through the process of looking at portfolios of families that wanted to adopt, but I just couldn't do it. Like my heart was so heavy and I didn't have peace about it. So I was praying about it and I was just like writing down the pros and cons and the cons of me keeping her outweighed the pros on paper. Okay. But in my heart, I just couldn't do it. So I was like, God, if I keep her, you need to make a way because I can't do this by myself. Yeah. And so I kept her and it was, you know, the best decision I ever made. And it wasn't an easy road because her father wasn't in the picture at all either, which um, I think was kind of nice raising my children on my own because I see other unwed mothers have to share their children with the other parent. And I see the children having to be shuttled between homes and it's very inconsistent and they don't have good routines. So in that regard, I'm thankful that I was the only parent with both of my girls and they didn't have to be shuttled from house to house. They had one set of rules. They had one set of direction and consistency in their life. I was able to give them consistency. And I think that's really important for children. They need routine. And when they get mixed signals and mixed direction from two households, I think that's, it's tough. I think it just presents another set of challenges. Yeah, I completely, completely understand. So, right, you're 25 at this point. So it's early 2000s by the timeline. Two kids who you have full custody of, right? And yep. you're on the path to paying down your debt. Yes. And at that point, you're obviously out of college. So when you graduated, were you able to get a step up in pay at all? Or were you still, were you doing the same job? That's a good question. I did get a few increases over the years. And shortly after Megan was born, I did leave the big three OEM that I was working at to go work for a fabricator. So that was a pay increase and it was closer to home, which was really important to me because traveling and putting two kids to daycare and and such, that's a lot of work. So I was at the fabricator for a few years and was doing well. Then 2009 came, which is where we had that big downturn. I think the housing bubble burst. I think that it was the loans that were overinflated. Right. The great financial crisis, as we've uh, yeah. we've dubbed it after the fact, right? <laughs> yeah. And so it really hit the Motor City very hard. And there were a lot of cuts in that area. So I had lost my job at that point. Oh, and in, I forgot to mention this. In 2006, I bought a house. So... I think I still had a little bit of debt, but it it had to have been much smaller at that point because I was able to buy a house comfortably. But my cousin Kelly was still living with us at the time. Oh, nice. Yeah. Honestly, I couldn't have done it without her. That's incredible. So we're in this house in 2006, 2009, the downturn comes. And my cousin David, his church was offering Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. And he sponsored me or someone at the church sponsored me to take that class because there's a fee attached to it. So I took the class, I think it was like nine weeks or something. And that class really turned my life around. It really helped me. It outlined a good foundation of how I should be avoiding debt, having that emergency fund and starting to save for retirement. Well, saving for retirement was still so far away from me. That was not even a consideration at that time. But I was able to go through the baby steps and it took some time. And that's when I really buckled down and started cutting the credit cards and closing them out as I was paying them off. And I honestly, I do regret because I closed out every one and I do all of them. Wow. Okay. (laughs) Which I guess makes sense when you're doing Dave Ramsey, right? That's the explicit advice. It is. And I I do regret that because now my credit history is like six years old. Oh, gotcha. (laughs) I suppose, right. It would be 25 years or something crazy. Which isn't a big deal. I mean, my, my credit score is great. And that's something that was always important to me. Even though I kept balances on my credit cards, I always paid the minimums on time. Like paying my bills on time was always very important to me. So Teresa, I wanted to jump in real quick. So Dave Ramsey obviously has done remarkable things for tens of millions of people. It is really a lifeline 
the financial piece and just the information he puts out. Obviously, we in the FI community know him as as very dogmatic about some things. And I think he he catches some flack for maybe high fee advisors. And I mean, there's some at the margins. There's some things that obviously we, we don't agree with. But I think his message and the way that he helps people has been remarkable. And I'm, I'm curious if you could point out maybe like one or two things just in your mind's eye that really stuck out to you. So you took that financial piece and this maybe it was just simply, hey, this is the first time I'm really getting a, a personal finance education. It might be as simple as that, but I'd love to hear it in your words, like what stuck out to you? So honestly, you you kind of hit the nail on the head. It was my first real education in any type of financial information. Just having a plan, those baby steps really just gave me a framework and something to build off of to establish some type of structure in my financial life. So I just I didn't have it. Like I mentioned, you know, our family always had debt. My mother, she didn't know. She didn't have the education, so she couldn't pass it down to me. And what I really love about Dave is what he says is he wants to change your family tree. And I wanted to change my family tree. I wanted that struggle to stop with me. And I wanted to be an inspiration for my kids. Oh, I love that. That is inspiring. I mean, that's really, it's inspiring to me to hear that. I, I don't mean to sound like cliche, but like, that's literally one of those chill inducing moments. Like you can literally change the trajectory of your entire family from here forward. And it's like that line of delineation, like, hey, today is the day that, that this story ends. Yes. And it was so important to me that I went back to my church and I told my pastor, hey, I just took this class. Can we bring it here? I think our church could benefit from this class. And he's like, sure, you're going to lead it. And I was like, oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) You walked right into that one. Come on. I sure did. (laughs) (laughs) But it was great. I I worked with one of the guys there, and we brought the class to the church, and we led it. And I had a small group. There was a few small groups, and we had the graduation ceremony and everything. It was really awesome to be able to take the little knowledge that I had started gleaning in my personal life and helping others, you know, spreading that message. By no means did I know everything, but I was learning and I wanted to share that with others. Yeah. And I love that. And you don't have to be the world's foremost expert, right? Like I think you just need A, to have an open heart and B, to be maybe a step or two ahead in, in terms of knowledge of the people who were you probably a year prior or six months prior, right, to have, when you found Dave Ramsey? And I think, you know, not to bring this back to choose a pie, but I think that's how we always conceptualize this show from the very beginning was, hey, this is the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. We really meant that. And we called it originally Experiments in Financial Independence because it was, hey, we don't know everything. Right. We're just trying to figure this out. And I think that really strikes a chord with people more specifically what you're talking about, obviously, and that like, hey, look, you're not standing there as the world's foremost expert on personal finance. No, You're standing there as an inspiring person who just went through this and is still in the muck a little bit, but is, can see the edge, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's awesome. Yeah. So back in 2009, when I had lost my job, I was on food stamps for about a year and I was on unemployment. I was trying a little side hustle. I wanted to be like a mobile administrative assistant. That was kind of my idea. And I was working for an auditor, managing his calendar and doing, you know, his billing and things like that, just for a little cash under the table to help supplement things. But that was a tough year. I mean, I kept the internet, but I cut the cable. I stopped coloring my hair. I stopped cutting my hair. We just bought the bare minimum. The church, my cousin's church that had the Dave Ramsey class, they had a food pantry. And I went there and got food from their food pantry. And Christmas rolled around and they sponsored, and I had no idea they were going to do this, but they sponsored me and the kids for Christmas. And they delivered like three garbage bags filled with gifts for the kids. It was the biggest Christmas they had ever had. Oh, my goodness. And it was just so touching and heartwarming, you know, to be a recipient of that. You just feel the the love, you know, and the outreach, which was really nice. It came at just the right time. That's amazing. You know, I think one of the through lines of, of your story so far is it takes a village. And I know, yeah. <laughs> right, like that phrase is often derided as uh, as some weird negative thing or, you know, whatever connotations it has. But I think 
when we come together as people, whether it's through church, through family, through government programs, which, you know, you, you've benefited from the connection of all three of those yep, things. Absolutely. When we come together, right, and, and provide support, it can truly help people. And I think a lot of times we vilify, especially those social safety net programs. But I mean, those were lifelines. Absolutely. Too. And I like to look at them as a bridge because it definitely wasn't a place where I wanted to stay, but it was a bridge to something better for me during that time. And it was necessary. And I'm forever grateful for that. And in, in 2010, my old employer called me back and said, Hey, would you like to rejoin us? I said, absolutely. So I went back to my original job at one of the big three working on my old team. So okay. I was a contract employee with them for two years. When in 2012, I interviewed and got hired direct. So that's a big deal. When you work at one of the big three as a contract employee, you're kind of on the outskirts. You don't get the same benefits as the direct employees. So when I was hired in direct in 2012, I had gotten a nice pay raise, better health insurance, nice 401k match, HSA, things like that. So just more vacation time, just good perks and benefits all around. Yeah, yeah. So that was yet another step in the right direction. Okay. So hold on, let's stop there real quick. So is that pretty rare to be a direct employee at one of the big three? Or is it, are there more contractors than direct employees? Or is It's it back then in the space, I work in containers. So it was mostly contract back then. Now it's mostly direct. Okay. So then it was, a, it was a massive step. So right at this point, I, I'm just trying to do the timeline in my head. I think your older daughter, Ashley is probably 11, 12 ish, some, somewhere around there. Yeah. And where are you at, at this point? Were you, I think you had purchased a house right before the great financial crisis, a couple of years before. Are you still in that house at that point? Yep. Still in my house. Living with your cousin Kelly or not? Kelly had moved out in 2009. Okay. Yeah. So I kind of felt like my life was falling apart a little bit at in that 09. point. Yeah. In 09. Yeah. And she left on good terms, but you know, it was just me and the kids at that point. So now it was really, I really am on this, in this on my own. But like you said, it takes a village. And so I really wasn't on my own. So working, I'm at work and I am reconnected with someone I had worked with back in 2000, Paul. And he was recently divorced and we actually just started spending some time together and we ended up getting married in 2014. Nice. So now my lot in life dramatically changed because the girls and I moved into his home and I still had my house and we were renting it out at that time. We were not making a lot of money on it and I didn't know anything about like house hacking. <laughs> I just listened to Coach Carson. I just bought his book too. Nice. Yeah, that's, it's amazing. The book is amazing. Um, I didn't really know much about it. And I think it was hard for me because it we just weren't in the right frame of mind for that. I still had a mortgage on the house and I was in this frame of mind where I wanted to pay off all of my debt, including my mortgage. So house hacking just wasn't in the horizon for me. It wasn't in my scope at that moment. Sure. So we did have just a family member living there and paying bare minimum rent just to cover the mortgage. And by the time we got married, I was completely debt-free minus the mortgage. And I had saved up about $20,000 in cash. Oh, wow. So you went from negative 20. So 20 is an interesting number, right? So yeah. <laughs> you were 20,000 in credit card debt when you first started out. And now you pay that off and you have 20,000 saved. Saved, yes. And wow. I brought that with me into the marriage because I thought, listen... So the first turning point for me was, I want to move out. I got to get my life in order. And the second one was, you know, changing my family tree was important to me. And then I was like, okay, if I ever want to get married, I have two children. And that's a big responsibility for someone to take on. I need to sweeten the pot a little bit, you know, and <laughs> bring something to the table here and not having debt and having a little bit of savings. It just made me feel proud to bring something into the marriage something positive instead yeah. of something negative. Well, wow. I mean, right. Even as just the pride, regardless of the bringing into marriage, it's just there should be great pride in having turned that around, right? I mean, that $40,000 swing while you're a single mom to two growing daughters. Yeah. 
that's pretty amazing. There are very few people who have done that just in the cosmic scheme of things. So, right, you should feel pretty darn proud of yourself just for your own accomplishment. Thank you. And that's kind of why I wanted to share my story, just because there were a lot of times of darkness and hopelessness and loneliness. And there are a lot of single parents out there. And I just, I want my story, although it's, you know, 25 years in the making, I wanted to share my story to encourage other single parents that it is possible. It does take time and it does take effort, but it can be done. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. So, right. It does take time. And obviously, it, it, you know, there was no, there was no windfall in this time. There was no, hey, I got a job making three times as much or salary negotiated. And it was just, as I'm hearing it to my ears, this was just consistent action and consistent savings from that time where you found Dave Ramsey, essentially, to now, now in the story, which is 2014, right? So we're talking four or five years at that point. Yeah. And frugality, too. My aunt gave me this book by Mary Hunt called Everyday Cheapskate. Okay. I've never heard of that. Yeah. So that also was very instrumental during those years for me to cut costs and and how to save money and things like that. That was another tool. Yeah. Okay. So, right. This was, hey, it's our family of three and we have one income coming in Yep. and we have our house who at, at that point, you did not have your cousin Kelly living there. So it was just the three of you in the house. Right. So it wasn't like you were getting some of the the mortgage supplemented or, or getting rent. So this really was a story of frugality during those years. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Living on the bare minimum. Yeah. All right. So, right. You met Paul sometime 2012, 2013, got married 2014. You had the $20,000 in savings, no debt, obviously, other than the mortgage, which is a totally separate issue, obviously. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, where, where do we go from there? So then in 2017, my mom had passed away. She had metastatic breast cancer, which was a terrible thing. And I hope no one has to go through that. But I was her oldest. And so I was the executor of her estate. Okay. So like I mentioned, uh, she didn't do well with money. She still had a mortgage on the home, even though she had been living there for over 30 years. So we had to sell the house. I have a little tip for everyone too. If someone passes and they have medical bills, you are not responsible for paying those medical bills. Really? Yes. All you have to do is call the, the doctor's office and give them a copy of the signed death certificate and they wipe that debt away. Oh, that's really interesting. I was definitely not aware of that. I thought for some reason it, it netted out of the estate. Nope. And also she had a couple of credit cards that she owed had balances on. So I was able to put a little notice in the legal newspaper that she had passed and this is her estate. And they had like four months, I think, to make a claim against the estate for that money. And then you have to mail a copy of that to the credit card companies. And if they don't come to you by that time period, you're off the hook for paying those debts as well. Oh, wow. And obviously, this could be state by state. I know yes. there are different rules in different states. So please, let's not assume that this is good for all 50 states. But regardless, this is really interesting information just to, I guess, see that question in people's minds, right? Because I would have been wholly unaware of that. So in, in Michigan, at least, that's how it works. That's interesting. So I guess what that leaves us with is different types of debts. There are different ways to potentially discharge them by paying zero or little upon death. So, okay, that's fascinating. Uh, you can see my mind is spinning because I'm, I'm trying to think <laughs> like, how can, we, how can we make that even more broadly applicable? But, but I think it, it is as simple as that. Like that is something that was outside of our, most of our zone of awareness before you just said that 45 seconds ago. So that's huge. Yeah. And I just wanted to put that out there because a lot of people don't know it. Because my mom had so little, we were trying to keep as much of what she had as possible, you know? Of course. So those are just two really great tips that I had discovered and, and wanted to share. Yeah. That's amazing. So out of her estate, my sisters and I each got like 22000 which was nice overall. I didn't expect to get anything. So my husband and I used that to pay down our mortgage. And around that time, we also sold my old house that we had been renting out. So we had two house sales. I think I got 15 grand from the sale of my house. So not too much, but again, it's better than nothing. Right. Because you said, yeah, you were underwater at some point on that. 
Yes. And then not not too distant past during the whole fiasco of 2008-9. Yep. So then we put that also to pay down our mortgage. And then working for the big three, we get an annual bonus. So we were putting that towards paying off our mortgage as well. Okay. So it sounds like, and obviously <laughs> this is not too hard for me to figure out, but it sounds like paying off that mortgage was like, priority number one. Is that like a, like a Dave Ramsey kind of vestige? Yes, that was Dave Ramsey's baby step seven, I believe, to pay off the mortgage. Or no, maybe it's six, baby step six, and then baby step seven is give like no one else. Right. It's that kind of like yes. obscure, like go live long and prosper kind of thing. Right. Which, so is, we- which is wonderful. I'm not, <laughs> not making fun of it, but it's, uh, it's not very prescriptive. Well, this is about the time where you come in because in 2018, we had paid off our house. So I had completed the seven baby steps. Finally, it took me a while, Okay, but I was looking for more. And so I was actually on one of the Facebook pages for uh, Chris Hogan. He was the retire inspired guy. And someone had been posting about choose up I on his page. And I was like, what is this about? So I found you guys in 2018. I started binge listening to the show on my way to work and on the way back home. And I honestly had no idea what you guys were talking about. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. like what is all of this? Oh man, It was a little cognitive dissonance, like trying to download everything that you're yeah. saying and process it all. But I was determined to learn about the spy stuff. That's so, so I, cool. I just kept listening and listening. And then eventually, you know, stuff started to click and I was like, I need to take action on this. I really liked Andy Hill's episode where he had his baby steps. I think it was eight, nine, and 10 with the continuation nice. of the Ramsey stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's way back in the archives too. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Andy Hill is, is awesome. It was episode 68. And actually the title was Financial Peace Graduates, What's Next? Yeah. So that's uh, very, very, very appropriate. Okay. Let's just slow down here because, well, first- you got pretty lucky that you were able to find that in a Dave Ramsey slash Hogan <laughs> Facebook group because around that time, I don't know why, but like they must have sensed us as like competition. So they always deleted anything related to Choose of I, which uh, really? or, or it happened to get deleted. I don't know if uh, <laughs> we're not going to make it a conspiracy here. But so that's wonderful that you found us because I think, frankly, what you said was I was looking for more. And I view Choose of I and Dave Ramsey as, as very complimentary in the sense that like we've said, and I've been very outspoken about how wonderful he has been for so many millions of people. I've said in this episode, it's that is the financial lifeline that people need when many of them are drowning. Yeah. Right. And the turnaround stories are remarkable. But let's be clear. What is so great about Ramsey is that he is so clear <laughs> on those really first six baby steps. And then you get to seven and it's like, all right, well, I have 60 more years. What the heck do I do? This doesn't... Uh, doesn't really help. I don't know where to go from here. So I was looking for more is exactly where Choose of High comes in, I think. Agreed. And it's funny because you said, obviously, you were lost when you found us and you didn't know lost in the sense that you didn't know what the heck we were talking about. Like <laughs> I, we try so hard to make it as simple as we can and not get bogged down in complexity. But it, as you well know, it's, it's hard. There's just a lot of information. I'm curious, like, and this might not be something you have an answer to, but like, would there have been any way that like we could have helped or that like the FI community could help bridge that gap for people who, hey, I just came from Dave Ramsey and now I'm faced with these hundreds of terms that like I've never heard before. Like, is that something you ever thought of or is it just simply like, hey, just go back and just keep listening and it's going to sink in? I hadn't thought about that before, but I think your episode 100 like is your starting point now. Yeah. I think, you know, that's a great launch point, but it's just, I think, a matter of learning, just listening and repetitiveness. Because just for me personally, it was a whole new realm of things. And you guys did a great job of simplifying it as much as you could. But there are so many layers, so many levers to pull, so many options, which is a beautiful thing. But it's also, there's a lot of choices in that. And not every lever is for every person. And I think I was so overwhelmed because I was like, I got to pull all these levers, but it's like, slow down. You just need to pull out of each episode what, do what you can do, right? House hacking isn't for everyone. I think index fund investing is for everyone. That's my favorite part of this whole thing. Nice. It's so easy breezy. 
Yeah, it certainly is. And that's, yeah, that certainty, that for me was one of those awakening moments when I first read, it was even before J.L. Collins had the simple path to wealth. It was when he had the stock series, which still exists on his site, obviously. But yeah, it just made me sleep better at night when I found that I didn't need to spend thousands of hours becoming a world-class investor. I just needed to match the market. And that, interestingly enough, and kind of shockingly enough, was going to be the highest likelihood chance that I had of gaining wealth over the next 30 to 50 years. Like that way of just basically setting it and forgetting it. So that was, I mean, that was amazing. And it's funny because I'm hearing you talk about levers and Jonathan is smiling from somewhere, uh, <laughs> somewhere here in Richmond, Virginia, hearing you talk about levers. That was his, his favorite thing. And, and levers you did pull, let's be clear, right? So you found us in 2018. And at that point, you and Paul were, were rock and rolling, right? So it's not like, it's not like you were on a bad trajectory. Obviously, you had paid off the mortgage. You paid off all of your debts. You had what I imagine is a pretty decent net worth at that point with paid off mortgages and, and some investments. I don't know exactly where you were. But I mean, you've made an incredible number of changes since 2018. And it's, uh, I don't even know how to tackle this because you sent this list in, in your <laughs> first email. But, but let's talk about some of them. I, it just even as like a, like a greatest hits of Teresa and Paul here. All right. So after finding Choose FI, we had just started working with a financial advisor that was Ramsey recommended. And I noticed that he had us in some mutual funds or something where he was getting 1% like mm -hmm. off the bat. So I immediately went to Vanguard and I had them move over our Roth IRAs that we had recently opened. And when I did that, he called me. And he was a little bit upset. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, we're just doing this index fund thing. And he's like, I don't know why you're doing that. And he's a little bit irate about it. <laughs> no <laughs> surprise like, there. Incentives, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> but we severed those ties. So we would max out our Roth IRAs. We were maxing out our 401ks pre-tax. So our savings rate was probably about 33% at this point. Some years we started to also contribute to the post-tax 401ks. Okay. You know how there's, and I didn't know this until you guys showed me, there's like two maxes in your 401k, right? Yeah, there's the employee side, which is what most of us think of as maxing out 401k. But then, yeah, you have a total limit, which is actually in the $60,000 in 2023. I don't know exactly right offhand, but it's $60,000 plus. Right. So we never made it that high, but we were at least tapping into that second level. Nice. So you made after-tax contributions to the 401k? Yes. Okay. Nice. So we're maxing out our Roth IRAs. We're maxing out our HSAs. And I stopped using the HSAs for medical expenses because we were cash flowing those and you know using that HSA as a retirement vehicle instead. Triple tax advantages. Yeah. We opened up a brokerage account and then eventually we were at Vanguard with that, but I ended up moving all of our stuff to Fidelity just because all of our work accounts were with Fidelity. And I, I just like the ease of having everything in one place. Then I started, I opened up a Roth IRA for each of my kids. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I learned that from the show as well. Megan at the time was babysitting. So whatever income she made from babysitting, I just matched that, put that in her Roth IRA. And then Ashley was working and I matched her income by putting that in the Roth IRA. And you know what? How I got that money is when my mom passed away, I took a little bit of that money that I had gotten from my mom's inheritance. Right. And instead of giving them that money outright, that's what I used as a match to fund their Roth IRAs. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So, right. It wasn't just, hey, well, I'm giving you this free money. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's what's cool, especially like as we think about teaching our kids personal finance, right? Because it, second generation FI is so important. And like you said, my family's story changes here. Absolutely. Right? That's the most critical part. And teaching them lessons and really incentivizing savings and proper, if you will, personal finance behavior is really important. And, and you can play fun games like that. Like, hey, Megan, if you're babysitting, what we can do is, and, and for every person out there listening who has a kid, you can fill in the blanks. You can do whatever you want, which is, hey, for every dollar you put in, I'm going to match it 
one to one. I'm going to match it two to one. You can do anything you want. I mean, that's what's fun about this. And just final word for me on Roth IRA for kids, at least, is so let's say they earned $1,000. Each of them earned $1,000. The actual money that goes into the Roth IRA does not have to be those exact $1,000. It's not like their money has to be immediately deposited in some weird, like it has to go through your paycheck or anything like that. No, it's just they have earned income in that calendar year of $1,000, which means you can put up to $1,000 for each of them in a Roth IRA. So that could come from the parent's account. That could come from a grandparent. It could come from anything. It can come from their account, obviously, but it doesn't have to. So I think that's just, Teresa, I I wanted to just take 30 seconds to explain that because I think it's important. I agree. Yes, it is. Also, when my kids started working and they turned 18, they each had a 401k that they opened up with their employers. So I have them investing in index funds with Roth 401ks. Okay. It was originally pre-tax, but because they're in such a low tax bracket, I'm like, you need to take advantage of the Roth 401k contributions. Nice. I love it. So I asked Ashley, she's my 24-year-old now, I said, can I share your net worth with everyone on the show? She said, yeah. She's got $53,000 saved up in retirement accounts Oh my right God. now. <laughs> At 24 years old? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's remarkable. That is truly, truly remarkable. Yeah. If everybody could see the smile on your face right now and just the, <laughs> the absolute beaming joy and pride. Changing the family tree. You did it. You <laughs> certainly did it. That is absolutely astonishing. So- Right. You've done all of that. And and obviously, it seems like many of these things are occurring year after year. So you're just funneling just an unbelievable amount of money into your savings account. You have no mortgage. You have no debt. I mean, this is not a life that costs very much in the cosmic scheme of things because your fixed expenses are not are just not there. Right. That's what's so cool about it. Right. Because I found minimalism along the way, as mm-hmm. well as frugality. Oh, you're speaking to my heart here. Let's let's <laughs> let's talk. And a valuist. I consider myself a valuist because I do enjoy spending money, but I like to buy a good quality item. And when I buy something, I keep it until like it doesn't work anymore, you know? And and I just don't like clutter. My husband doesn't like clutter, which, you know, that's a win. It is a huge win. So we've got a lot of time to do things because we have very little to take care of, right? Very little maintenance on on stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's so brilliant. And yeah, just the the mental load that is not there walking into a cluttered room. Oh man, I tell you. Remarkable. It is. I have my one little oasis in my house of my my office and that's that's about all I got in terms of in terms of that, but but we're trying here. Also for college, I just wanted to share what I do with my kids for their college tuition. Paul and I had said that we would pay for them to go to a community college to get their associate's degree. And then if they wanted to get their bachelor's at a local university, we would pay for that too. I said, if you want to go away to a four-year university and live on campus and all that, they would have to fully fund that through scholarships okay. and loans. I said, I'm not paying for that, but I will pay for you know the community route. So they both agreed to that because I, I didn't want to set them up with debt either. You yeah. know, I'm trying to teach them to avoid debt. And then- We only pay for tuition if they get an A or a B. So if they end up earning a C or less in a class, they have to reimburse us for that tuition for that class. Wow, that's very, very interesting. And that again is every family has can set up these these rules. And that's what's kind of fun about this. And I'm sure some people are hearing that and being like, oh, that's a little little intense. But I think there are a lot of people who are cheering you on and saying that is absolutely brilliant. And there should be repercussions for not taking something seriously, especially something that costs a good bit of money. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So now it's 2023 and my girls are out of the house. So we're empty nesters. Oh, wow. Yep. And our employer actually offered a severance package this year, just a couple months ago. And because we were in such a good financial situation, without hesitation, I told my husband to click the button and to sign up for it. So he took the VSP, which is a voluntary separation package, because when he hired in just over 20 years ago, he had a pension, a very small pension, but we opted to take it as a lump sum so that we could control it and invest it ourselves. Okay. 
wait, all along these years or just now when he clicked the button? When he clicked the button, then he was able to redeem that pension. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yep. Okay. So we could have taken it as a monthly payment, but if we were both to die, then the kids wouldn't get anything. Oh, so I thought, okay. let's take the lump sum. And then if we both die, it's already in his 401k and then the kids would inherit it. Okay. Wow. So just something to think about if anyone has a pension plan, you know, that's just something to consider. Yeah, that's so interesting. And so, right, even just in the last minute, you basically said kind of offhandedly two things that you really benefited from being in such a position of financial strength, right? Like at that point, hey, we can almost instantly have Paul click the button. Yep. And I think Paul's a little bit older than you. So for him being at that point, okay, we're work optional at that point. Now let's make it, hey, this employer is offering, I think you told me a year of severance and then this lump sum, right? Yep. So last week he got his lump sum pension payout, which went into his 401k. And then he got one year of salary that went into our checking account. Wow. It was taxed, you know, drastically, but it was still a good amount of money. And between those two events, we hit our fine number. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Okay. Jeez, that's amazing. Did you know, like, had you already done that? Because you ha you've had spreadsheets since you're in your 20s. Yeah, I look at that stuff all the time. And I had an idea. And I actually, when the announcement first came out, I was going to click the button too. I was like, I'm taking it. I'm taking it with yeah. you. And he panicked a little bit. And he's like, hold on. What about medical insurance? And we can't lose two salaries at once. And I said, okay, okay, I'll just keep working. So I am still working full time. Okay. He is doing handyman stuff like carpentry on the side just for fun, you know, at his leisure. And now I'm at the point where I'm 44 and he's 56. So there's a big age gap in between us. So now I'm trying to strategize our drawdown strategy. And what does that look like? Because I think he's got till 73 before we have RMDs in his 401k. So that's potentially, I think, 17 years of Roth conversions that we could activate or, you know, when should Social Security come into play? I just, I have so many questions yeah. because of our age gap, how that would work. Yeah, that is, okay. Well, first, congrats, obviously. Thanks. That is absolutely <laughs> amazing. So, right, reach Phi. Paul is now at Phi. He's not working anymore. Right. I can understand it. You know, it's funny because we can see that number on the screen and we can know in our minds, right, our actual intellect that, okay, I've reached Phi, but it's still, there's that trepidation. Are we both going to hit this button? Is this real? <laughs> is this absolutely real? What are we doing here? So I can certainly understand why you guys made that decision for you not to push the button. And that's not to say, I don't know if, uh, if that was a short term, is that something that's off the table now? It's off the table. Yeah. Okay. Historically, have there been offers like that? Not this good. Okay. But it may happen again in a few yeah. years. You never know. And also, I think a lot of us think from, even my question was almost from like a point of scarcity of, oh, you have to wait until <laughs> until then. <laughs> but that's the beauty of Phi. And I think somebody like Grumpus Maximus, who we've had on the show a number of times, and actually he wrote a book through Choose of I Publishing on whether pensions were worth it. Now that's slightly separate, but the conceptual framework is the same of, okay, there's still that decision point. And I think a lot of us do it from that position of maybe scarcity or being nervous, or I can just wait it out. I can tough out these X number of years. And that person might already be at five, <laughs> right? That extra money to give up those years of their life just simply isn't worth it. But yet we're all scared. I think that's normal. So I think your joint decision made sense from that standpoint. And that doesn't preclude you, obviously, my silly question be damned, from hanging it up next year or six months from now, right? Even if the offer doesn't come. Well, and that's the freeing thing. You know, I don't need to work if I really didn't want to. And just knowing that has given me this level of freedom that is so hard to explain, which I know you understand. But I think about because I'm so young, I still need about six more years of income to prevent any zeros on my social security statement. Have you guys talked about that at all? 
You know, we haven't actually. I, I know there, yeah, there's some intricate info with that in terms of, right, like years worked and credits and such. That would be cool. So, okay, when you just laid out, you know, drawdown strategy and such, my mind instantly went to, all right, we're an hour plus in on this episode. We can't possibly do that today. But would you be up for coming back for maybe we can get an expert to come in here and really go through that drawdown strategy? Because I think this would be interesting for a lot of people. Absolutely. That would be wonderful. Cool. Okay. So that's great. And then we have that extra wrinkle of Social Security, which frankly, I think we did talk about Social Security maybe once out of 600 episodes, like in some level of scrutiny and rigor. But yeah, we need to we need to do that again. So, okay, that's a promise to the audience here. We're going to do that again. I think everybody, if you're as interested in Teresa's story as, as I am, which I suspect you are, that'll be a, a, a pretty cool round too. So this has been amazing. And as you know, what, what Jonathan used to say was on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But Teresa, would you be up for, uh, for doing an old school hot seat? Let's do it. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, Teresa, we'll start with question one. So we used to ask, what's your favorite podcast, blog, or book? But let's not make it too grandiose. Let's make it, is there anything that's come across your plate recently? Just any type of media, book, podcast, blog, something like that, that you've really enjoyed recently in like the last year or so? Oh, yeah. So I've been binging Cultish. It's a podcast called Cultish. Ooh. It's pretty fascinating. They talk about cults, obviously, and how bad theology hurts people. Just very fascinating. But then it tied into blurry creatures, which I've been binging to. <laughs> Interesting. I feel like I've seen them in my podcast app, but I didn't, I never clicked. If you want to, you know, dip your toes in the paranormal and kind of get into some mind bending things, check out Blurry Creatures. Okay. Nice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Though I think the last thing on earth I need right now is more podcasts. <laughs> I tried so hard. I mean, for longtime listeners, oh, I've tried so hard to like cut the list down to virtually nothing. I think I'm up to, like, I think I have 80 podcasts that I now download on a <laughs> weekly basis, but luckily I'm smart enough to at least delete most of them, except for the ones that I'm like thrilled to listen to. But yeah, it's a lot. So, okay. Question number two, advice you would give your younger self? Do it afraid. It's okay to fail. I have issues with perfectionism and that often paralyzes me and my decision-making processes because I feel like if I don't execute something perfectly, then I don't even want to try. And I'm still, I have to tell this to myself still today, like just do it even if you're afraid. Yeah, that is great advice. And yeah, I think a lot of us get caught up in that perfectionism and it's just a very silly, destructive mindset. I know I've, I've been certainly <laughs> guilty of that for a long time, but yeah, just... It's never really gotten me anywhere, right? It's a, we can't be perfect. We're human, right? Yeah. All right. Let's go with question number three, your favorite life hack. Oh, so when my kids were young, we did sneak in a couple of Disney trips. I was able to take the girls each for their ninth birthday. And my hack for that was giving them an allowance every day to spend. So, you know, when you go to Disney, after every ride, there is a gift shop <laughs> and they're selling things along every street corner. And so instead of my children begging me to buy them everything that they saw, I said, here is $25 or whatever it was. So every day I gave them their little allowance and they were allowed to spend it on whatever they wanted. And it was so wonderful because they weren't asking me for stuff. They were making the decision on how to spend their money. So they were going around the store, checking prices, looking at different things, saying, nope, I can't afford this, or walking around the store with something and evaluating it. Do I really want to spend my money on this? And my older one, Ashley, said, do I have to spend my money? Can I just keep it and take it home? And I said, you absolutely can. <laughs> ding, so ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. What a lesson in budgeting that you might not have even expected it would have been that good of a lesson. I didn't, but it was great for them and it was great for me because it took away the gimmies. You know, give me this, give me that. Yeah, that's great. 
All right, let's go to question number four. An inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful? I think it was my mom's passing because it helped me get an insight on how things work in death. Like we we have birthdays and we celebrate birthdays and we plan and celebrate weddings and you know babies and death is such a big part of life. Everybody is going to die at some point. But that's another thing that people don't like talking about for some reason. Even though we all know it's coming, we just don't know when, right? Yeah. So we knew my mom was sick, you know, she was in hospice and I sat her down with my sisters and you know, we went through her will. She had a, a living trust that I encouraged her to get and she did. But we sat down together and I asked her, hey, what are some items that you want to go to specific people? And we wrote down that list. I said, how would you like your funeral to be executed? What what do you want us to do? What do you want that to look like? And we wrote it down. It wasn't a comfortable conversation to have, but it was necessary. And it was such a beautiful gift to us because, you know, when your loved one dies and you're mourning, you don't want to think about any of the financial stuff or any of the planning on the funeral execution. So it helped us just put everything in place without any thought because everything was already written down. And I also pulled her credit reports, which is another tip. Try and close out credit card accounts while your parents are still alive. If you're able to do that, that made the process a lot smoother too. But just death is a big thing. Everyone has to go through it. So I think we just need to start having more open conversations about it and start normalizing it. It's just good for everyone. Yeah. And I think, like you said earlier, normalizing conversations about money and now about death. I mean, these are, like you said, we are all going to die, whether we like to think about it or not. And yeah, it's just really important. I, I just wanted to dive into that that piece of advice. So closing credit card accounts. Now, we talked a little bit ago about if there are credit card balances, that there are certain ways, and of course, depending on your state, but were you talking there about closing out zero balance cards? Correct. Yeah. While they're still alive, if you can encourage your parents to just kind of go through, you know, pay them if they can, you know, pay them off and close them as they go. You know, it just, it makes the whole process after death smoother for everyone. Okay. That's really great. All right, Teresa, our last question is uh, one of the newer ones that I've kind of added in. So I'm interested because uh, we talked about this. So pay off the mortgage early or not. So I know you really went after paying off. You and Paul certainly went after paying off the mortgage. But looking back, is that the decision you'd make today? Talk me through that. Yeah, so absolutely. So I'm kind of glad that I was on the Ramsey path and had that kind of implanted, you know, in my brain to pay off the mortgage because there's such a divisiveness in the FI community about whether or not to pay it off which is great. I mean, because it is a personal decision. For me, I'm so glad I did it because it was more of an emotional issue. The peace that it brought me to not have that debt hanging over our heads is just indescribable. And when COVID rolled around and people were losing their homes or they couldn't pay their rent, we didn't have to worry about any of that because we didn't have a mortgage. So, you know, I know there's a lot of financial benefits of keeping a mortgage potentially with tax credits and such. I, there's just, like I said, a lot of debate on it. But for me, paying it off was the best decision and I don't ever want to get a mortgage again. Nice. Good for you. And yeah, it is very personal. And it's funny, I think the uh, tax benefits of your primary mortgage are severely overblown, especially in this day and age of the standard deduction being so significant. Yes. So most people do not itemize their deductions. So you get very little additional benefit, most people, most, for having mortgage interest, basically. It's just the actual additional benefit for that is going to be zero if you are using the standard deduction, which the vast majority of people do. But then it just comes down to, like you're saying, it's personal preference. You can make the case, I think, for many of us who have mortgages that have a 3% interest rate or got really lucky before things went up, yeah, you can make the mathematical case, certainly, especially now that simple bank accounts are paying higher than that many online bank accounts. All right, you can certainly make the case. But as you're saying, that peace of mind of having that thing gone is wonderful. So 
there's no dogma here. It's just personal preference. So Teresa, this has been remarkable. It's amazing to see your story from 18 with that first credit card to single mom to, like you said, food stamps to your cousins intervening in, in multiple ways and Dave Ramsey and then you teaching and then obviously you and Paul finding each other and having this remarkable financial life. And it's just amazing. So thank you so much for sharing your story. And I'm really excited about doing part two. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Nice. Until next time.